Hi, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk about the first of Anselm's three philosophical dialogues, that being on truth. Uh, now, this is in a, uh, usually found in a volume. Uh, this includes all three of the philosophical dialogues, on truth, on freedom of choice, and on the fall of the devil. Um, and you will find in the rest of this playlist, uh, going through class discussions of the other two as well, uh, so in this one, I want to introduce the dialogues as a whole, and then go through briefly uh, some of the things that Anselm talks about here in this first dialogue. Uh, so first of all, uh, the dialogue format here is not exactly the ancient Socratic format that we might find in Plato and in others, uh, where we have the, the sort of teacher figure being Socrates asking probing questions for the student or the learner to answer and then gradually come to knowledge by answering questions. This is more of a back and forth dialogue between teacher and student, where the teacher is asking these kinds of Socratic probing questions, but the student is also asking clarifying questions that the teacher is then going to be answering. And the teacher in this dialogue is assumed to be Anselm. Uh, it is reporting Anselm's views, at least. The three dialogues taken as a whole uh, represent a discussion primarily of freedom, so freedom of choice, hence the name of the second dialogue, uh, as well as moral psychology, uh, and the interplay between, uh, between divine providence and human free will. How is it that we and God both act and both interact? And what does this have to do with our moral decision-making, our salvation, uh, and uh, all sorts of other things? Angel is here, by the way. She wants to leave, but she might. Bye, Angel. Anyway. So this first dialogue serves as a kind of introduction uh, to these topics. And it is, a, uh, it is an introduction both to these topics and then also more broadly to the concept of truth in general and what is meant in Anselm's particular context by truth. But this goes into far more detail uh, and has a much broader sense and a much broader way of understanding what truth means uh, than simply what we might think of as correspondence to reality, uh, which is the ordinary, uh, the ordinary colloquial uh, and, uh, and general philosophical understanding of truth. Anselm wants to uh, examine it more closely, examine the concept of truth, and see where else it might apply in addition simply to propositional statements. So to begin with, uh, he goes into a, a series of questions throughout this dialogue as to what truth is among certain kinds of things. The most obvious being uh, the truths of uh, significations, statements, opinions, things like this. What is it to say that a statement or an opinion uh, or a, uh, a signification is true? And he ultimately winds up concluding that to say something is true in this sense, in the very simplest sense, uh, is to say that, it is, that truth is a kind of rectitude perceivable only to the mind. All right, so what does this mean? Uh, rectitude is a, uh, is a complex term, and it's used here in a very broad context. Rectitude means correctness, but it can also mean something like straightness, like the straightness of a pen or of a ruler or that sort of thing. Um, to say that something is uh, has rectitude is to say that it is correct, to say that it corresponds correctly, but also to say that it is straight, like an edge. And the reason why he wants to differentiate uh, rectitude more broadly and rectitude perceivable only to the mind is because he wants to differentiate rectitude qua correctness from rectitude uh, in terms of something being physically straight. Right? Because we don't want to say that, uh, that truth includes things like something not being bent or not being curvy. Right? We want to say that truth uh, is rectitude, but the correctness of something, the proper alignment, let's say, of something. And this is why we say that it is perceivable only to the mind, so not to the senses. Uh, so not perceivable by sight, uh, like straightness of the ordinary sort would be. So, okay, if rectitude of a statement, if, tr uh, if sorry, if truth of a statement is rectitude perceivable only to the mind, what else can we apply this to? 
So this clearly applies to an opinion. An opinion is true if it is correct in a way that is perceivable to the mind. Correct in a conceptual way. That the concepts do what they are meant to do. The opinion or the statement does what it's meant to do, which is to connect one's mind in proper alignment with reality. So this is the closest we have here to the sort of classical, traditional definition of truth as correspondence to reality. But we also wind up looking at several other things that he says can be true in certain senses. He also says that uh, things like the senses can themselves be true if they're functioning properly. He says that actions can be true if things are acted or enacted properly. If things are done correctly, then those actions, and therefore the will that enacts them, is correct, is true. And this is where we get a connection between the concept of truth on the one hand and the concept of justice on the other. Because you'll ultimately wind up uh, concluding that justice as a concept is form of truth, it, but is a form of truth that resides in the will, so a kind of true willing. So ultimately his, def his definition of justice will be rectitude of the will, so having a correct will, preserved for its own sake. We'll come back to this definition near the end, uh, because this is ultimately his conclusion that's going to lead directly into the next dialogue on freedom of choice. Before this, I want to make uh, one distinction that he makes very early on and then applies to each of these instances of rectitude or instances of truth. And this is the distinction between ways that something can be true. So he begins by looking at a statement or an opinion. A statement can truly signify in two ways. In the full ordinary sense, and the way we usually mean to say that a statement is true, is that it signifies that what is, is. This is his, his uh, terminology here. Uh, but we can say this, again, more simply, that it signifies reality. It signifies that what is real is really real. That what is true is really true. Now that winds up being a bit of a circular definition. We're using our term in the statement, but hopefully it winds up clarifying a little bit as to what we mean. However, there is a sort of shallower sense that we, can, uh, that we can say that a statement is true or that it signifies truly. We say that something signifies when it correctly stands for something. We say that I signify a microphone when I point to it. This is uh, the, uh, the sort of early scholastic or early medieval concept of what signification is, what words do. Words are signifiers. This goes back to Augustine. Um, and these signifiers, these words, indicate what they are indicating by, uh, by pointing, like a signpost. So when I say microphone, or when I do this, I'm doing roughly the same thing. I am signifying a particular kind of thing, and in both cases I am successful at doing so. By either saying microphone or by doing that, I am indicating that this that there is this thing here. I'm indicating what this is. I'm indicating it to you, the viewer. Similarly, a word. Uh, for example, if I were to just open the book and refer to a word that will appear on screen, chapter. This word indicates a certain thing. This signifies a certain thing, namely, the words that follow are signified as chapter one. It labels it. It places a, uh, it places a label upon something such that we can refer to it. Anselm points out that a statement can succeed at signifying even if it does not signify something correct or true about reality. For example, I can say the, uh, I can state the proposition that it is uh, 11.30 a.m. as of this recording. 
this is false. Um, in fact, uh, it is approximately 10.30 p.m. when I'm recording this. This indicates a difference between what is being signified successfully and the state of being in reality. So if I signify something which is false, my statement still succeeds insofar as it signifies what I'm trying to signify, what I'm trying to say. Right? If I say it's 11, if it's 11.30 a.m. as of this recording, you know what I mean. You know what I'm saying, and you know what it would be like for that to be true. And so Anselm says that this type of signification has to it a degree of truth. That to signify is the most, uh, most proximate end or the first end, the first goal, the first purpose of signification. It is to signify. And so the statement, it is 11.30 a.m., is comprehensible. You know hearing that statement, what it means, what it would be if that were true. However, if I say it's after 10.30 p.m., now I am not only signifying something that you can comprehend, I'm signifying something, but I'm going further than this, I'm going beyond it. I am not only signifying something, I am signifying something true about reality. And because I'm signifying something true about reality, the statement is now not only filling its proximate end, but filling, but fulfilling its ultimate end. Because the ultimate end of a, of a statement uh, for Anselm is not only to signify, but to signify what is true. To report that what is is, and what is not is not. Now, an aside. We can use statements to signify things that are false, and we can do so successfully. Whether that is simply a lie, uh, as is my, my statement of it is 11.30 a.m. right now, um, or if this is something more sophisticated than that, you can signify something which is strictly false in a way which tells something else. For example, if I were to speak in metaphor, uh, if I were to say uh, it's nearly midnight, well, that isn't quite true, but it is an indication that midnight is approaching, that the night is going on, now being past 10, 10 30 p.m. I might say, again, by analogy, that I am uh, that I am dead on my feet if I were tired. Now, of course, that's false, right? That signifies something, my death, my non-livingness, but it, it succeeds in signifying that, but then it fails to signify what is true, the fact that I am alive when I say it. But we can go further than this, and this goes into things like the various ways of interpreting texts, that me saying that I am, quote, dead on my feet, signifies something analogical. It signifies that I am tired as if I were dead. Now, the simple statement that I'm dead on my feet, for example, does not, uh, does not uh, in our context, in our social context of knowing that turn of phrase, we know in our communication what that is attempting to signify and then what it correctly signifies. If I am actually very tired and fatigued and my legs are not holding me up properly and all of that, then that we would say that on one level, it signifies that I am in fact not living and therefore that it signifies something successfully it has a kind of rectitude, but not the complete kind, because it signifies something false. However, if we have some more social context to this, and we know the turn of phrase, we know that this, further than that, signifies that I am tired. That's what it means. And this, it signifies correctly under these circumstances. We can also apply this to things like fiction. We can signify something uh, like... Uh, Frodo Baggins is the ring bearer in The Lord of the Rings. Okay. So we're talking here about a person, Frodo Baggins. And we can signify Frodo Baggins, a fictional character. Our words can succeed at signifying a particular character 
and a particular narrative element in the story, being a ring bearer, bearing the one ring, etc., taking it to Mount Doom, and all of that. But what that signifies is, strictly speaking, false. And so it only, it only signifies, in a very literalistic level, correctly in this first shallow sense, that it succeeds at signifying, but not signifying that what is, is. However, it does signify what is, is, within the context of a story. And then, things within a fictional story can, in fact, signify, and therefore indicate and tell, true things about our reality as well. We can learn lessons from a story. We can learn things about, say, heroic courage from, uh, from the story of a heroic character. Uh, we can learn a moral lesson from, uh, from a morality tale uh, or from a fable, that sort of thing. We can learn something about ourselves and our society uh, from the analogies uh, and the allegories presented in a story. And so by creating these stories, which are on the face of them false, strictly speaking, what we are doing is we are communicating something beyond that. We are communicating something true. And so what we are doing is we are not saying that Frodo Baggins is a real person of, uh, of approximately three foot two inches. Right? What we are saying is that this is a character in a story which tells us certain things about, uh, about our world beyond it. And so we can apply uh, Anselm's principles here. That words can succeed at signifying, even if they do not signify something true. We can indicate that we can talk about things which are fictional. So things that are on the face of them in a, in a very strict, literalistic sense, not true. But we can say that they signify something beyond the mere obvious meaning of the terms. Uh, what Anselm would call signifying improperly, so not what is strictly meant in a, in a uh, perfectly clear philosophical sense, but can signify what is true due to convention. Understanding the way that things are said, it can, uh, the, the stories of Frodo and the Ring, for example, can signify things beyond the, the upfront truth of what the words are saying. And if we understand what those words are attempting to signify, we can then further understand that they are not only succeeding at signifying what they're trying to signify, but they are succeeding at signifying something true, but only if we understand that first shallow part. And this is, again, applicable to what Anselm has to say here directly, where he points out that if a word or if a phrase or if a statement fails to signify anything at all, it cannot possibly signify something fully, something true. It cannot signify that uh, what is, is, if it can't signify that something is. So you need both of these aspects. You need this initial aspect of succeeding at signifying at all in the way that it's meant to, and in the way that it's meant to both contextually uh, and of itself, in order to signify something fully true. Okay. Now, part of the reason he brings all this up, and part of the reason he spends so much time talking about truth and signification, the truth of signification, and uh, these different uh, degrees of rectitude or truth, is so that we can apply this to action and the will. So he brings up a similar distinction with respect to action and the will, that an action can be true, in other words, it can have rectitude, it can do something correctly, in two ways. It can, in the shallowest sense, it can succeed at what you are attempting to do. But further than that, it can succeed at the kind of thing that it ought to be directed towards. So, for example, I can succeed at taking my book that I have in my hand right, and dropping it on the ground. As you can hear, thud, it falls. Right? I have succeeded in my attempt to drop the book on the ground. However, that is not clearly what the book is meant to do. So my action here of dropping the book on the ground 
has succeeded in one sense. It is the correct action insofar as it has aligned correctly with what I was attempting to do. However, we have the further question of what should I have been attempting to do with this book? Now, if I pick it back up, what I ought to do with a book, what a book is for, its natural end, is to convey information. It's to be understood, it's to be read and to be understood and to convey what information it holds. And so instead, if I open the book and read from it, or use an example from the book as I have been doing, that is not only, not only is that action successful, if I'm successful in conveying its information to you and successful at reading the information myself, but it is fully successful. It is fully correct. It has rectitude in this fuller sense. It is doing what it ought to be doing successfully. But now we can take this into a more moral action as well. There's a significant difference um, between uh, attempting to murder someone, for example, and succeeding, and then further attempting to uh, and succeeding at helping someone. So if you attempt to murder someone, you can succeed at doing so. In which case, your action will have succeeded. It will have, it will have accomplished what you set out to accomplish of you know, an innocent person's death. And therefore, what you have done is something that is wrong. You will have acted untruly. But you will have acted truly in the sense of you will have accomplished what you set out to accomplish. However, by contrast, if you were to help someone who needed help, or someone you had an obligation to help even further, what you will have done is you will have accomplished what you set out to accomplish, and you would have set out to accomplish the correct thing. In the same sense that if I say, if I say a statement which is true in the full sense, it has, on the one hand, uh, first, accomplished the task of conveying the information to you that I intend to convey, and I have intended to convey information which is actually true of the real world, which is correct in the full sense. It has rectitude, fully, in the same way that an action can. An action can succeed at what it's trying to do, can be true in this shallow sense, but it can also further than that be true, can be just, we can have rectitude of the will, in this fuller sense that it is not only succeeding at what it's trying to accomplish, but trying to accomplish something which corresponds to the way that reality is and ought to be. All right, so there's one more element here. So we've got rectitude of action and therefore rectitude of the will. But we can take this a step further and look to his definition of justice, because he adds something here. Because it's not merely that something is just, uh, that justice is rectitude of the will, but it is rectitude of the will, he says, preserved for its own sake. Now, why we add this is that rectitude of the will just means that you are doing the right thing. You're doing something that is correct, the thing that you ought to do. Now, rectitude of the will, we say it is preserved uh, for complex reasons that will become more apparent when we get to the second dialogue, when we get to on freedom of choice. So hold off on that, or just continue immediately after and go to the next set of lectures. That'll become clear as we go, why he, why he points out that it needs to be preserved. But the reason we say that it's for its own sake is explained here, because he points out that there is a significant difference between doing the right thing and doing the right thing because it's the right thing. It is not correct to help someone to gain advantage from it. Because what you're doing is not properly characterized as helping someone. What you are doing is properly characterized as, uh, as helping yourself. And these are different actions. We might analogize this once more to language and to statements. You might say something true purely by accident. I might make up a story or even make up a lie that happens to be true. Just surely by, surely by accident. I did not intend to say something true, but it turned out to be 
It is not correct, therefore, to say that what I said was uh, that I told the truth. I was attempting to lie, and I failed. Similarly, with correct action, just action. If I act selfishly, and it turns out to help someone else, we can at best say that what I have done is acted in a morally neutral way. I haven't hurt anyone. I haven't set out to hurt anyone. However, if I set out to hurt, any, hurt someone, and through my own incompetence, wind up helping them instead, what I have done is not morally right. It is not just because my actions failed. And this is because this sort of two-tier setup uh, of truth, of rectitude. If my action, if the action I was attempting and my will was not to help someone, to do the good, to do something that I ought to do, then this initial stage of rectitude isn't fulfilled. So if I try to hurt someone and I wind up helping them, Suppose I try to poison somebody, but I mix up the poison with a delicious flavoring agent. Sorry. And uh, due to my incompetence, they get a delicious meal. I have attempted to murder someone. And I have failed to do so. It's not that, my, that in my will, I have aimed to give them a good meal and succeeded. These are radically different. Um, because there are these two steps... The first step is that your will and that your action succeeds at what it is attempting to do. That is the bare minimum form of rectitude. And the further form of rectitude that it corresponds to what is and ought to be can only follow from that. Because that first step is what defines the action. Just like for statements, the rectitude in this first shallow sense, the successful signification, is what defines and determines what the statement is saying. So, this rules out the possibility of doing something good for the wrong reasons. You're not doing something good. You're just doing something for the wrong reasons. And it just so happens to have good consequences, un, uh, unknown or unbeknownst to you. So what this ultimately winds up meaning is that to do the good, to do justice, to will justice, is to preserve rectitude of the will, so to do something correct, not just correctly, not just this first stage, not just to do something and succeed at doing it, but to do the right thing and to mean it in the right way as an instantiation of justice. All right. So I think that is that more or less covers uh, everything that he has to say here in the first chapter, uh, or sorry, in the first uh, the first dialogue on truth, uh, and this will I think lead quite well into uh, on freedom of choice, and then ultimately into on the fall of the devil. Uh, you'll find those also in the same playlist, um, uh, the lectures I have and the discussions I have on those. Uh, so please do continue. Uh, this is I will say uh, this this book encompassing the three of these. Uh, is very well may be my favorite piece of uh, of prose philosophy of uh, in maybe in history. Um, there are a lot of brilliant insights here, both what we've gone over now and what we will go over in the, in the subsequent lectures. Uh, so I hope that you learn as much from this as I have. All right. So thank you for listening, and I'll see you then.